train They filled her through this land of ours And filled a sportsman's dreams Enjoy what nature holds for us Her bounty never ends Getting back to basics With the practical sportsman It's always an adventure No matter where we go From a favorite hunting spot To the highest fishing hole Outdoor life we all can share With family and friends We'll do it all together With a practical sportsman We'll do it all together With a practical sportsman Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. It is Thursday night, November 2nd, the year 2000. Of course, you know what this means. Well, in five days, we have a big national election, right? But the big news is, in 13 days, we have the opening of Michigan's firearm deer season. And for the next half hour, we're going to talk about how to have fun deer hunting and how to protect your fun. Stay tuned. You wanted me to have a proof that my grandfather gave this gun to me, and it was just... To me, I felt harassed. Fred Tro's Practical Sportsman is brought to you in part by Marbles of Gladstone, Michigan, a maker of high-quality handcrafted sporting knives and sporting specialties that stand the test of time since 1898. Construction workers in Michigan are in high demand. The Michigan Regional Council of Carpenters knows that carpenters and millwrights have many opportunities. Our 18,000 plus members stand for quality in work and in life. The Carpenters and Joiners Union, building with pride and quality for over a century. By Hawk Hollow Golf Course Banquet and Convention Center, featuring a clubhouse which accommodates 700. The 27-hole golf course winds through 500 acres of woods, hills, and lakes in Bath Township. Hawk Hollow, a beautiful place for a drive. And by the financial support of viewers like you. If you're driving down a certain logging road in the UP the third week in November, you'll drive by a deer camp where each guy in camp has a nickname. Whoa, that's Meat. The nickname Meat reflects his hunting skill. So your name is? Dave Huey. From? Midland. Oh. You talk like a youper. Well, you get that when you hang around these youpers up here after a while, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you, spend the, you spend the week up here with them, and, and you start talking like them, you know? Yeah. And so. so what do we have here? You got your four-wheeler. That got... belongs to Virgil. What was in here? Well, that was our order. We, uh, we brought salmon and walleye up, and we fried chickens in there the first couple nights. Huh. Deep fry them, and oh, big French fries and stuff, you know, the first, because we was here a couple days early. And this is the famous sauna? This is a sauna, here. This is just our storage shed. We make these two. We make these little buildings. Mm -hmm. My brother's got a jig for it. There's so oh. we can keep clean. Sauna in the trailer for two, yeah. and then this is the wood stove. Mm -hmm. Hot okay. water bucket. Be See, when we're done with this, this door folds open here, and then we can fill the trailer up for storage hmm. for hauling our stuff up here. That's pretty neat. And the conduit, little area there. Put your uh, wood. Boy, you don't have much wood left, mate. That's just enough for the sauna, just for tonight. And then you're leaving? Yeah, we'll leave first thing in the morning. We'll start packing up. It takes us about four hours to break it down. Oh, it looks like you have the facilities there. Yeah, ain't that nice? <laughs> that is. It and all you... comes apart with about four or six screws. Huh. And into the trailer it goes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I build a shed at home. We put all this stuff, the tent. Well, that tent, that's an army tent, but it's covered with big tarp. Right. How Keep, come? When you get heavy snow up here, the snow sticks to the tent. And it will stick to the tent. So we bought that big tarp and put over top of it, and it keeps the tent dry so we don't have to set it up when we get home mm -hmm. to dry it all out because all your rain and snow washes off to the side. And it insulates it. It keeps it quite and helps keep it a lot warmer with that uh, blue tarp on there. Mm -hmm. That's home, home sweet home. Yep. 
Now, why is this place known as Trollville? Because the Upers call us trolls. We're from down under, don't you know? Ah. So they, Toomey says, we got to have a name. So he says, you guys are trolls. He says, so this should be Trollville. <laughs> One of the first years we was up here. So I had to make a sign. We got a sign stuck out there on the road. It says Trollville. The sign is an advertisement of where the guys from this deer camp are from, but they've spent the first week of deer season here for many years. I know it doesn't look like much, but you don't judge a deer camp by how it looks, or by the number of beer kegs by the door, or by the outhouse, or even by the fact that it has a portable sauna, or by the size of the blue tarp that covers the army tent. And you cannot judge a deer camp by the number of bucks on the pole either, or the size of the bucks the hunters get. To my way of thinking, you judge a deer camp by the hunters who are there. Do they brag and play the macho role, or do they share what they have, like the hunters in Trollville share their deer to eat in camp? Deer camp really isn't about deer, at least in my opinion. If it was, the gang of hunters at Trollville would never come back. They only got two bucks last year. The attraction of Trollville isn't the deer, it's Trollville itself. Make a little breezeway, you know, because this gets all wet. And this has been the nicest year we've had up here forever, I think. Weather-wise? Yeah. I uh, notice everybody wasted their time bringing snowshoes, though. Well, <laughs> I've been here before. I don't come without them. Meet. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Get back across the bridge so you can blend in. Yeah. Get back home so I can shave, you know. <laughs> Ma, she'll be really impressed when I get home. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Trollville, the legend. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you exactly where Trollville is, other than it's somewhere in the Upper Peninsula. Because like many deer camps, Trollville is not a tourist destination. It's personal to the hunters who are a part of it. Well, last year the deer hunting was really slow around Trollville. We were just down the road a ways with the 4G's camp. We didn't even see any deer, hardly any tracks. But if you want the big deer, you need to go downstate. That's where most of the big deer are in the southern part of the state. Of course, it isn't the same having a deer camp down there as it is up in the UP, up in the boonies. But those big deer are to be had in southern lower Michigan particularly. Tim Hayes was at the museum last Saturday and I asked him if he's seen anything unusual so far this season. Well, I've seen lots of things interesting from a pie ball to a partial pie ball to this. <laughs> and what in the world do we have here? This is uh, one of the most unique wrecks I've ever come across in, in my life of working with wildlife. It has, uh, it's a white-tailed deer taken here in Michigan. It has triple drop tines. It's got the one on the one side and one on the back. Oh yeah, on the back there. It has double brow tines, which in itself is very unusual. How many points? Um, officially 19. Um, every point seems to branch off like a mule deer would. You can see they've all, all huh. Come. All this very unique, very dark colored rack. Um, so you think you're holding the biggest one of the year here? Well, possibly the biggest bow kill of the year. Um, it hasn't been officially scored yet, but I rough scored just the mass at 190. Um, plus it has a 21 inch inside spread. So after deductions, we'll find out uh, what it ends up at, but it's it's big in my book. Yes. Well, on Big Buck Night, we'll get to see somebody else holding that rack. Yeah, you'll get to see the man who actually took the deer, and he'll have a finished mount, and you can hear the story, which is very unique, on how he got the animal. The hunter who got that buck and will tell the story is Chris LaFontaine. He's from Marion, and you will be seeing him on Big Buck Night. Now, speaking of Big Buck Night, I said two weeks ago that five of Michigan's public TV stations are going to be running Big Buck Night on December 7th, and two will air it on the 14th. There's been a schedule revision. All six public TV stations will telecast what will actually be my 22nd Big Buck Night from 8 to 9.30 on Thursday night, December 7th. Now, that includes Channel 56 in Detroit, and on Thursday night, December 14th, 
An hour-long Big Buck Night will be aired from 7.30 to 8.30 on WWTV channels 9 and 10 up in Cadillac for the Northern Lower Peninsula. So mark that down. Once again, we're going to be looking for the biggest bucks from each county. And how do I determine what's a big buck? Well, I use three criteria. One is the number of antler points. The second is the width, the maximum outside spread. And the third way is how tall the tines are. Now, you can qualify for a Marbles Hunting Award with any of these three criteria. In other words, if you have 10 antler points or more, or if you have an outside spread of 18 inches or more, or the rack has an antler tine 10 inches or longer, each of those will get you a Marbles Hunting Award, and that'll get you in the running for Big Buck Night. So you can have, say, a six-point with an 18-inch spread and qualify out that having fun was really the ball game for deer hunting. It really is. Big bucks, that's just kind of a sideshow. It's fun, too, but the main objective is to get with your buddies and have a good time. Now, there are two kinds of people, though, that in recent years seem to be hampering the fun of far too many sportsmen. One is the obnoxious, overcompetitive, um, you, know, you know the type of guy I'm talking about, the hunter who just always has to have his things his way and he infringes on the fun of the other hunters, whether they're in his camp or his neighbors or, or whoever he runs into. The second type is a conservation officer. Now, and it didn't used to be this way. COs used to be sort of the PR arm of the department, but now they're out there to write tickets. And there are an increasing number of conservation officers who unfortunately uh, feel it's their job to be really overzealous, uh, rude. They, they go beyond the scope of their job, what the statutes say they can do, and definitely beyond the scope of the constitutional rights of sportsmen. Now, these are problems. Now, let's take the first one of these first. What do we do about the rude, the crude, the obnoxious sportsman who, who is a game hog? Well, this comes up when a hunter, for example, this is probably the most common one, hunter shoots a deer, Deer runs off before the deer expires. Hunter follows it. Lo and behold, here's another guy there who says, Ho, oh, this is my deer. Now, what do you do about that? Well, this is a problem, by the way, that's all too common, especially on public land or when people have to chase a deer and when the deer is of substantial size. There's a lot of hunters around. Uh, that greedy, obnoxious aspect, selfish aspect comes into play. Well, I learned a principle here from studying this same type of problem in law school when we looked at the whaling industry, some cases that go way back to the you know, hundreds of years ago. In the whaling industry, all the whales that are out there in the ocean were regarded as free to anyone who could capture one. And that's the same principle we have with wild game. They're free until a person captures or possesses one. Now in the whaling industry, when the first harpoon was fired and hit the whale, Oftentimes, it took other harpoons or a period of time or the, the whale would get away for a while, and the original boat didn't always end up with it. Sometimes it would wash up on the beach and be found a week later. And whose whale was it? Some people said, hey, I found it. It's my whale. Well, it was regarded generally in the whaling industry that the first person to put a harpoon in it, to make contact with it, to uh, you know, put the animal in a position where it was vulnerable was the one who ultimately could claim the whale. I think that same principle we could use in deer hunting. Uh, in other words, the first hunter who, who hits the deer has the claim to it. If he's on the trail and he's going to get that deer. Now, some, some hunters will disagree. They'll say, no, nope, finders keepers. Well, I'm not a finders keepers advocate on this. I think a person does have a claim, but that's my opinion. Now, there's a couple things when people ask me, what is the rule? What is the law? Whose deer is it? Now, here are some principles that, that I've just come up with on this. Number one, no law. In other words, no statute uh, defines possession in a way that helps hunters sort out whether the first hunter to hit the deer or the first hunter who gets it after it's dead has claim to the deer. So there's no, there's no statute that lays this out. Secondly, in life, not law, in life. The law of the jungle often prevails. In other words, big guy, bad attitude, trumps the small guy with good attitude. Uh, that doesn't make it right, but too often that's what happens. The muscle, the strength, the intimidation gets the deer. Um, I don't know what you can do about that. Those, those, are, those are two facts that we have to live with. Now, thirdly, here's, here's something on a more practical note. When you shoot a deer in the heart or lungs, which has been recommended for years so you don't waste meat, 
the deer generally runs the distance, even though it's dead on its feet. Now, this is when possession can turn into controversy. The deer is actually on its way to die very quickly, sometimes in a matter of 10 or 15 seconds. Somebody else is on the other end. Here's what I recommend, a practical approach for a practical sportsman. It's what I do when, uh, when I'm on television and, and I shoot a deer. My principle is when you shoot a deer in the shoulder, it puts the deer down immediately, generally kills it immediately. Possession, problem solved. Let me know when. Dumped him right there. Shoulder shot. That was perfect. That was perfect. Now, I'm not trying to be skirting this issue of whose deer is it, but law can only go so far. Law enforcement can't solve a lot of these problems for you. They're human relation problems. Choose carefully who you're around when you're hunting. Um, have these principles yourself, and it will help everybody and to protect yourself, uh, shoot the deer in the shoulder, put it down, and go get it. You've solved a whole lot of problems right there. Now, that's one type of problem, dealing with other hunters who are just selfish and greedy and, and tend to mess up your day. The other thing I want to talk about is conservation officers who take the law right to the limit and pass the limit. The problem here is they're not doing public, public relations for the department. They're, they're intruding on private citizens' lives to see if they're doing anything wrong. This is way beyond what most law enforcement officers are allowed to do under the Constitution. And the problem is hunters are out on opening day. Maybe they've leased property. They expect to be alone. They go to great lengths to put signs up, to keep the area quiet. And here comes officers walking in at 9 o'clock opening morning. Disrupts the whole area, disrupts the hunt. If anybody else did that, that could be called hunter harassment. Well, this is the concern. When does the conservation officer overstep the bounds, become inter to interfere with hunters unconstitutionally, illegally, and certainly unethically and unnecessarily? I'm going to talk about this question specifically in the seminar on November 11th, up in Alpena. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. On next week's show, I'm going to get into these regulations that have to do with the tags and the permits that conservation officers seem to dwell on so much. But right now, let's talk about this issue of the authority of a conservation officer just to come up and say, let me see your license, let me see your license, cough it up. Uh, a lot of sportsmen say, so what's the matter with that? Well, there's, there are a number of problems with that. And here's one, for example. I know Fishing doesn't have quite the concern that hunting does with interfering with fishing. But here's what happened when I asked a fisherman about getting checked by conservation officers numerous times in one day. You guys have been? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Like, like, what's your experience? You mean uh, about the fishing incident? Yeah. Well, we were checked uh, as many as three times a day on the, on the ice last year. Fishing, why? What, did you change your clothes in between? Uh, no. Nope. Guy just said he couldn't remember uh, our faces. He said he didn't remember faces, so he just checks everybody sees. Huh. Three times in a day? Yep. And he made you go through the whole thing? Through the whole rigmarole. Pull out your license and show it to him. Everything, yeah. Huh. Were you the one, Jim, that, that said that, that you went to the bathroom or something, restroom? Yeah, I went to the restroom and I came back, uh, was going back out on the ice and the uh, guy said, check me again. And I said, uh, well, what's the deal? You just checked me on the ice not 15, 20 minutes ago. And he said, well, you know, people have been known to leave their coat and their license in the, or change their coat and not have their license with them. He said, I just wanted to make sure you had your license. I said, well, here it is. So I had it. So you might say, what's the matter with that? Well, no other law officer can do that. No other law officer in this country can walk up to you in a public area and demand to see your ID, your identification. Show me, prove to me who you are and that you have a license to do what you're doing. That's not constitutional. State police, city police, county sheriffs can't do it with your driver's license. They can't demand to see your identification if you've done nothing wrong. Conservation officers have been doing this and, I think, abusing that process. There's another big reason why the contact with conservation officers, when they are coming in and they're on the, quote, attack, they're not there to help you. They're looking for violations. And 
the Constitution protects citizens in this country from having law enforcement people knock on their door and say, you mind if I look around and see if you're doing anything wrong? Well, the answer is yes. If you have no reason to believe I'm doing anything wrong, then bug off. And you don't have to, as a private citizen, uh, show proof that you own your car and show proof that you have a license unless you've been caught doing something wrong. Now, I've advised sportsmen to, to not put themselves in a position where they're getting checked and they're, and they're letting conservation officers rummage through their truck and go through their camp. Why not? Well, here's a very good example of something that just happened in the field to a hunter. I asked him, what was your experience with a conservation officer? Uh, mine was out deer hunting and uh, had a pretty old shotgun of my grandfather's when he passed away I received. and. Uh, the CO insisted on it was a stolen gun from two weeks prior up the road where I was hunting from and just went and let me off on it and eventually the other CO that was with them pulled her away and that was about it but insisted on that it was a stolen gun huh. and, and I know as well as that it wasn't but you know, it was just a little bit of harassment. So, so what does that do to your day? I uh, put a hurt on it. I was a little upset you know I'm out there trying to hunt and then I get harassed like that, and then it makes me think of all the times where I've been out hunting and never, never seen a CO. And then when you first time, that was actually the first time I had ever been uh, checked for ID, and then I got harassed that bad. I mean, what, when you say harassed, what, did she threaten to take the gun or anything? Well, yeah, she wanted to take it and check numbers and get a hold of. Uh, she wanted me to have a proof that my grandfather gave this gun to me, and it was just. To me, I felt harassed, and I thought it was uncalled for personally. How long did all that take? Oh, probably about 15, 20 minutes. I was waiting for another friend to come down the trail, and the whole time they were there, then they checked him and wrote him a, a citation for coming out of the woods too late, but they never let off on the gun. Huh. I'll be nice. You, you know you look like a criminal? I do? Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, that's not the face of a criminal. I mean, my golly, what is the face of a criminal? You can't tell by that. That's profiling. And, I mean, a situation where a guy is accused of illegally having a gun, this is what you open the door to when you allow any law officer to come in and rummage through your car, rummage through your tent, rummage through your camp. Uh, they don't know what they're looking for, and they come up with things that just make a lot of headaches uh, that aren't even based on any criminal act. But I'm just trying to, to help you avoid those situations that may not result in an arrest, but certainly put the hurt on your day, as Fred described. Well, I, I do want to tell you that this statute, allowing conservation officers to check anybody anytime, has been tested in one of our western states two years ago, ruled unconstitutional by their state Supreme Court. We are looking to do that same thing in this state. Who is we? Well, it's the Sportsman Civil Liberties Association we're talking about. That's November 11th. That's the meeting, the organizational meeting for this. And, of course, the question that we're going to be focusing on for two hours is what authority do CEOs have to stop hunters, demand to see their licenses, frisk them, search them, search their tents, their cabins? What authority do they have to trespass on private land during the hunting season? I will touch on some of this next week, but November 11th, we're going to talk about it for two hours and come to some conclusions about what you can do to protect yourself and protect your fun while you're hunting. Now before you wig out with some attitude that I'm trying to protect poachers and protect criminals, now quite the contrary. Uh, I am trying to protect law-abiding citizens so they can enjoy privacy, they can enjoy their property, they can enjoy their experiences uh, when they're doing nothing wrong. Now, there's a difference of philosophy that people have about law enforcement. Some people feel that you've got to catch every last criminal and you're going to snag some innocent people with that, but that's the cost of it. People like me believe I would rather protect the innocent people and let a few criminals go because that's the price I'd rather pay. I mean, it's up to you. It's a philosophical thing, but at least you know where I stand. Now, next week, we're going to monkey around with something a little bit dangerous, uh, and here's a glimpse of what I'm going to have on the show. I just, I'll just hold this a minute. Hopefully yeah. we can... So this is exactly what you did before. Yep, and he come right from that distance to here, and I was done for. So he could do that right, right now. Right now, yeah. 
Oh, this is this is this nice. buck gored Bill Yoder with 31 puncture wounds three years ago. Bill's health has been touch and go ever since. Join me, Fred Trost, for a report on Bill and his bucks this week on the Practical Sportsman. That's coming up next week, right here on Public Television. In addition to that, I will have Mike Stewart on the show with this double-edged knife business. I mean, this is something of, of real legal concern of hunters who have a lot of different hunting knives. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of different issues, but make sure you get your mind geared up to have fun when you're outdoors. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Fred Tro's Practical Sportsman is brought to you in part by Marbles of Gladstone, Michigan, a maker of high-quality handcrafted sporting knives and sporting specialties that stand the test of time since 1898. Construction workers in Michigan are in high demand. The Michigan Regional Council of Carpenters knows that carpenters and millwrights have many opportunities. Our 18,000-plus members stand for quality in work and in life. The Carpenters and Joiners Union, building with pride and quality for over a century by Hawk Hollow Golf Course Banquet and Convention Center, featuring a clubhouse which accommodates 700. The 27-hole golf course winds through 500 acres of woods, hills, and lakes in Bath Township. Hawk Hollow, a beautiful place for a drive. And by the financial support of viewers like you. It will stick to the tent, so we bought that big tarp and put over top of it and it keeps the tent dry so we don't have to set it up when we get home mm -hmm. to dry it all out because all your rain and snow washes off to the side and it insulates it, it keeps it quite and helps keep it a lot warmer with that uh, blue tarp on there. Mm -hmm. That's home, home sweet home. Yep. Now why is this place known as Trollville? Because the Upers call us trolls, we're from down under don't you know? Ah. So they. Toomey says, we got to have a name, so he says, you guys are trolls, he says, so this should be Trollville. <laughs> One of the first years we was up here, so had to make a sign. We got a sign stuck out there on the road. It says Trollville.